During the 14th century BCE, Pharaoh Amenhotep III set his historians to the task of digging into the records of the 3rd and 4th dynasties, more than a thousand years in the past, to bring forth details about ancient religious rituals and practices that Amenhotep could use to reform Egypt. This act and the religious changes which would follow during the time of his son would forever change the course of civilization more than almost any other single event in human history. From this research and subsequent religious restructuring came an idea so toxic and traumatic that the pharaoh who implemented the changes, his son Amenhotep IV, who would change his name to Akhenaten, would be stricken from the Egyptian king list, his statues destroyed, his temple dismantled, and every official record of him erased so that only secondary sources which escaped notice would carry his memory. The change was so damaging that Egyptians generations later would think themselves cursed, and their writings made clear the feelings of despair left behind by these two pharaohs. What was given to Egyptian people was a counter-religion, incompatible with the belief in other gods and goddesses, a complete denial at access to the afterlife, and a message that all which had been known and believed and obeyed before was now blasphemy. Though it lasted only 30 short years, its effects would be felt for centuries until the idea resurfaced again in the East and took root once more. Egypt had just invented monotheism. I'm your host, Jason, and you're listening to Dragons in Genesis. Before we can deconstruct the Exodus story, we must first come to understand the events and stories that influenced the authors. One cannot fully understand a tale of two cities without some knowledge of the French Revolution, and one cannot understand the creation of the Exodus narrative without learning a bit about certain key events which occurred between 2300 BCE and 500 BCE. Now don't worry, I'm not going to bore you with 1800 years of Near Eastern history, but there is a lot to cover before we can get into who Moses is. Not was, but is. Moses exists today as he existed thousands of years ago, as a fictional character. Was would imply that there was once a man on which this story was based, but more than a century of archaeology has failed to uncover a single mention of the man outside of Jewish literature. Beyond that, in every place where there should be evidence for a mass exodus of Jews from Egypt, such as a sudden dip in the census, drastic change in crop yields, a reduction in expenditure due to the decrease in population, etc., there is nothing. Or rather, there is something. The records show that life in Egypt is pretty much business as usual. So if there was a mass exodus of Jews from Egypt, it wasn't massive at all. In fact, it would have to have been so minor an event that it escaped notice by everyone. Beyond the endless evidence that clearly demonstrates that no mass exodus occurred from Egypt as is described in the Bible, there is no evidence of a sudden influx of nearly a million people into the land of Canaan. Notice I said, as is described in the Bible. This is because there is one instance of a mass exodus of Semitic peoples from Egypt across Sinai and into ancient Palestine while being pursued by an Egyptian army, and a man with a name strikingly similar to Moses did play an important role in their leaving of Egypt, but this historic event didn't play out in the manner you're familiar with. But I'm getting ahead of myself. To understand the climate that could produce the Exodus narrative, we must first learn a bit about several people and events, namely the Pharaoh Senefru, King Sargon of Akkad, King Hammurabi, the Hyksos, and the Pharaoh Akhenaten. So let's take a quick glance at those five people rather, four people and one group of people. First up is the pharaoh Senefru, from around 2600 BCE. Who was Senefru? 
Snefru is the reason we can say definitively that ancient aliens did not build the pyramids. It was during his reign that we saw the transitional stages of pyramid construction from stacked rectangular monuments to the classic pyramid design that would be copied throughout Egypt. Snefru continued work on an incomplete step pyramid called the Medum Pyramid, which resembles a tall ziggurat comprised of a tapering base with a taller tapered tower rising from its middle. The second pyramid during his reign is an attempt to refine the step design and create a true pyramid, but this attempt sort of failed. It's called the bent pyramid because the original angle was too steep, 54 degrees. And halfway through construction, the weight was too great, so the angle was changed to 43 degrees, giving it a bent appearance. This 43-degree angle would be used in the final evolution of the pyramid under his reign, in his third and final construction, the Red Pyramid. A balance would later be struck between the squat 43-degree pyramid and the failed 54-degree attempt, and later pyramids would settle on an angle close to 50 degrees. These stages which show a clear evolution from stacked rectangular structures to the recognizable pyramid design, clearly demonstrate the trial and error phases of overly ambitious designers, rather than the designs of a light year traversing alien, which Giorgio Tsoukalos would suggest. But apart for overseeing the transitional stages in pyramid design, Sinefru is known for another accomplishment, one for which Moses would later become famous. Not only was Senefru a lawgiver called the master of all justice, he also parted a large body of water in miraculous fashion. Here's how the story goes. Senefru liked taking pleasure cruises on the Nile, lounging on a ship which was rowed by naked women using gold-plated oars. One day, while enjoying such a distraction, one of the slave girls dropped a fish pendant made of turquoise into the water. She complained about the lost pendant, wanting the original returned rather than to be given a replacement. So Senefru had his chief priest cast a spell, which parted the water and folded it over itself like a quilt, allowing him to retrieve the pendant and return it to the thoroughly impressed girl. Then they held a great celebration with thousands of loaves of bread, hundreds of jars of beer, and an ox. Sounds like my kind of party. Now, no one actually believes that Senefru parted the waters to retrieve a turquoise fish, but we should recognize the beginnings of a pattern here. We have a just lawgiver who looks out for his people and parts a great body of water. It's not a complete template for the Moses story, but it's certainly a kernel. Next on the list is Sargon the Great, or Sargon of Akkad, from around 2300 BCE, who may or may not be the world's first emperor, depending on how you define an empire. Not just satisfied with ruling one city-state, he went on to conquer as many as he could get his hands on. If you lived in Mesopotamia, which most of you probably did not, then you were likely a subject of Sargon. And while most kings inherited a city, Sargon built his own. He adapted cuneiform script to his own language and promoted it so thoroughly that it became forever known as Akkadian, named after his city, and displaced Sumerian to such an extent that the latter language became a dead language just a few centuries later. He was also the first to use unified units and measurements. Before his time, each city used unique measurements for length, volume, time, weight, etc., once under the rule of Sargon, those cities had to adopt his standard units, which streamlined trade. The system would be refined and improved, fall into disuse, and then re-emerge under the Persian Empire, where it would radically improve their ability to trade with a plethora of foreign nations. You might recognize some of these measurements for which Sargon and his successors are responsible. The foot, the cubit, a step or a yard, a league, bushel, shekel, grain, and pound. While some of these units existed prior to his reign, they differed in value from city to city, and sometimes from merchant to merchant, having whatever meaning and value the individual decided at that moment. So you can imagine that going to Walmart was pretty much chaos. And if that's not all, his daughter, 
in Hiduana is the first known author. Prior to her time, all written works were anonymous. But it's Sargon's birth narrative we should be concerned with. He is born of a princess, but his mother could not keep him. So she bore him in secret and placed the baby in a basket, which was sealed with bitumen, and placed in a river where he came to settle in the bulrushes. There, a drawer of water plucked him out and raised him. Now let's check these off. The father is unimportant. The mother bore him in secret. The mother placed him in a basket. She seals it with bitumen. She places him in a river. He settles in the bulrushes. A drawer of water discovers him. He is then drawn out and raised. We literally cannot read a single line of his origin story without finding at least one detail which would later be used in Exodus chapter 2. Without even continuing through the life of Sargon, we already have enough of a template to build Moses, and we haven't even mentioned his leading an army through a sea of reeds to invade a city in Anatolia, a miracle he claimed was made possible by the gods allowing him and his army to cross on dry land, or the fact that the name of the nearest city to Akkad, the city of Sephora, is almost identical to the name of the wife of Moses, Zephora. But we'll get back to Sephora and its connection to Moses when we talk about King Hammurabi. So we have Moses' greatest miracle in the story of Senefru, and his origin story in the story of Sargon, and we're still 1,700 or more years away from the editors compiling the book of Exodus. How much more of his narrative can we collect? Let's jump forward five centuries to 1750 BCE in the time of Hammurabi. Hammurabi conquered all of Mesopotamia and owed much of his success to his ingenious use of water. When besieging a city, he would dam the river and deprive the residents of water until they surrendered. And if surrender was not forthcoming, he'd break the dam and let the man-made lake rush in to flood the city. Either way, when Hammurabi's army arrived, your defeat was not long in coming. Hammurabi was a great administrator, diplomat, conqueror, innovator, and builder. He reinforced and heightened walls, improved infrastructure, built temples to the gods, streamlined trade, and improved irrigation. But while he was conquering new lands, he was also looking out for those he had already conquered, and not just those racially similar to himself. His policies improved the lives of all residents, not just his fellow Amorites. To him, it seemed, the Babylonian Empire was one homogenous entity, no matter how diverse. Perhaps the most convincing example of this was the law code which was introduced during his reign. Many articles seem to have been designed to end or prevent blood feuds between disparate groups within the empire. Rather than allowing infighting to tear the nation apart, he unified the many city-states under one rule of law. And it is this law that ties him so closely to Moses. Unlike the fictional stories of Senefru's parting the waters and Sargon's fantastic origin, the law code of Hammurabi is a historical fact. Unlike the Ark of the Covenant, which only exists in Nazi movies, you can see the Stele of Law, also called the Code of Hammurabi, which currently rests in the Louvre Museum in Paris. The Hammurabi Code used the Law of Retributive Justice, where the punishment directly fits the crime. A perfect example of this can be seen in a portion that outlines the punishment for causing grievous injury to a man. If a man puts out the eye of another man, his eye shall be put out. If he breaks another man's bone, his bone shall be broken. If a man knocks out the teeth of his equal, his teeth shall be knocked out. Sound familiar? If you read Exodus 21, it should. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and so on. There are dozens of laws from the Hammurabi Code which are repeated nearly verbatim in the book of Exodus. And of course, like Senefru and Sargon, Hammurabi was chosen by his god to lead the people. And like the laws of Senefru, his laws came from on high. 
Oh, almost forgot about the city of Sapara, a Semitic name so strikingly similar to the name of Moses' wife. It's where Hammurabi erected his law code. Let's recap. From Sargon, we have a mother who bore him in secret. The mother placed him in a basket, seals the basket with bitumen. She places him in a river. He settles in the bulrushes. A drawer of water discovers him. He is then drawn out and raised. He came from the common people, claimed legitimacy by the will of the gods. From Senefru, we have a bringer of law who cared for the common people and the slaves. He parted the waters. He claimed legitimacy by the will of the gods. And from Hammurabi, we have the introduction of a law code, stopped waters and brought them crashing down upon enemies to win battles, cared for the common people, introduced eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth justice, claimed legitimacy by the will of the gods. So at this point in 1750 BCE, we have collected enough details from three historic figures to build a template for a fictional lawgiver. Now, while some of these stories were obviously fictitious, the kings who spawned them left their mark on the historic record. We have contemporary evidence that each of them existed, including writings from outside sources which mention these kings by name. After this period, we begin to see mythical figures throughout the Mediterranean following this template. They all work great miracles and all fail to leave behind any historical evidence for their existence. One such figure is Dionysus. Wait. What does the Greek god of wine have in common with Moses? Well, he is born in Egypt, is exposed to the Nile, and gets his name Mysis, which means saved from the water. He lives near an Arabian mountain called Nyssa, which is supposed to be Mount Sinai. He passed through the Red Sea on foot with a multitude of men, women, and children, parted the waters so they could walk on dry land, commanded by a divine being to conquer a barbarian nation, had two rays of light proceed from his forehead, commanded drink to spew forth from a rock after striking it with his staff, and engraved the god's laws onto two stone tablets. In Dion Murdoch's book, Did Moses Exist?, he outlines 45 different parallels between Dionysus and Moses. Suffice it to say that parts of Dionysus' story so greatly resembled the story of Moses that the Hebrew liberator could have been charged with plagiarism had he ever existed. The archetypal lawgiver template of the ancient Mediterranean world is applied to both characters so thoroughly that scholars have been noting the striking similarities between the two since they first began taking a critical look at the Bible. And like Dionysus, Moses managed to leave behind no evidence of his existence in the ancient world. In fact, most biblical scholars no longer believe that Moses was a historical figure. An idea first floated around more than a century ago, but has now become consensus. But what of the story? What about the mass exodus and the sudden appearance of monotheism in Egypt? We've seen where the idea of a Moses-like character could come from. But what about the setting for Moses? This brings us forward 200 years to 1550 BCE, to the time of the Hyksos. In the 17th century BCE, Palestinian immigrants who had settled in Egypt during the previous century took advantage of an unstable government and seized control over Lower Egypt. Historians aren't entirely sure how the transfer of power occurred, but famine may have played a role. Anyway, this group of Palestinians became the new rulers of Egypt, holding the land for over a century. Who were these foreign rulers? Well, no one is quite certain. It's obvious that they were Semitic by their names, burial practices, and the temples they constructed. All of these link them with Semitic groups from the east of Egypt around modern-day Syria and Israel. But as there were dozens of separate tribes, pinning it down to one group is impossible. More than likely, they were a mixed group of Easterners from Palestine and beyond. Another key to their nature comes from their worship. While in Egypt, they worship Set, the god of the desert and of storms, which they identified with Baal Hadad, the storm god of Canaan. Let me clarify this detail. It may seem strange to us that an Egyptian god would be identified with a Canaanite god, but in ancient times this was quite common. 
As most deities were representations of forces of nature, they were sometimes thought to be universal. A storm god was a storm god, and that god didn't change because you visited a new land. The name was all that changed, and that was a name given to that god by the locals. So if you prayed to the god of storms, you just found the nearest storm god temple and called the god by whatever he or she was called in that city. In Canaan, it was Baal Hadad. But to the west, in Egypt, he went by the name of Set. Understanding this view is crucial to understanding the impact of the next individual and the changes he brought. Religions in that time were typically tolerant of foreign gods because they saw them as merely renamed versions of their own gods. Thus, there was no shock when new gods arrived in society. In a way, all the gods were compatible, and so religious conflict was rare. Back to the Hyksos. After ruling Egypt for over a century, King Amosis I led a revolt and drove the Hyksos from Egypt, reclaiming the land and establishing the 18th dynasty. The Hyksos fled back the way they had come, across the Sinai Peninsula, back into Canaan. Sound familiar yet? It should. It's a twisted version of the story you already know. A group of Canaanites go into Egypt, probably because of famine. They are there for an extended period of time, then they leave Egypt to return to Canaan. The key difference in the story is their status while in Egypt. But if you had lived in a country for over two centuries, ruling over it for half that time, and were suddenly evicted, you might tell your children and grandchildren a different version of the story. One where you were the victim, not the oppressor and one where you left triumphant instead of being chased out. You might even tell your descendants that this rocky land is so much better than the old world, despite the frequent famine. A land that flows with milk and honey. And if you tell the story often enough, for long enough, you might even start to believe it yourself. But the best part of all is that your land, dry and cracked and unreliable as it may be, is the home of the one true God. Not one God among many, but the only God, and not some aspect of someone else's God, but a God unto himself. And that brings us back to the beginning of this episode, back to Akhenaten and the idea of monotheism. Two centuries after the Hyksos are driven from Egypt, Amenhotep III had a grand vision in which the entire culture and religion of Egypt would be revolutionized. Drawing on sources from a thousand years earlier, he began to create a new, more mystical religion. Rather than be subject to an entire pantheon of squabbling deities, the great nation would bask in the eternal rays of a single creator who blessed and provided for his people. Under the rule of his son, Amenhotep IV, this religion would be implemented. Amenhotep IV changed his name to Akhenaten, a name which directly linked the new king with Egypt's new god, Aten. This new religion not only required the citizens of Egypt give up worship of their original pantheon, it demanded the belief that the original pantheon never existed. In Egypt, there was now only one true god, and Aten was his name. Unlike earlier gods, Aten could not be portrayed because he was formless, so no graven image of the god could be produced. The only acceptable image was of the sun's disk and its life-giving rays as a symbol of Aten's blessing. All life, all creation stemmed from the Aten, and as Aten existed as a solitary god, the worship of Aten was a counter-religion incompatible with all other forms of worship. In Egypt, you would worship the one true God and could have no foreign gods before Aten. The pharaoh Akhenaten taught that Aten was an invisible god and thus idols, especially those to monstrous Egyptian gods, should be destroyed because visible representations of gods distracted people from the worship of an invisible god. Akhenaten's monotheism and its violent opposition to all other religions only lasted a few decades in Egypt, but upon his death, his temples were dismantled, his statues destroyed, and his name erased. Later references to the man did not even list him as a pharaoh, but called him the enemy. <laughs> 
so little of his reign survived that DNA testing was required to positively link the least known Egyptian king of the 18th dynasty to his son, the most famous and thoroughly documented of the pharaohs, King Tut. Centuries before the first mention of Yahweh, the great and terrible storm god of the Shasu tribe, all of the elements needed to create the Moses character and the Exodus narrative existed, whether in the real world or in folklore. These themes, which were well known at the time, inspired a multitude of stories and characters that employed these narrative tropes. This isn't to say that the Moses character couldn't have existed as an actual man and that the Exodus story couldn't have happened. But if he did exist, he passed through life without leaving behind a single historic footprint and made such little impact that his deeds went unnoticed in both Egypt and Palestine until the 6th century BCE when Exodus was compiled. And if the great Exodus actually occurred, it too escaped notice by all parties involved, playing no great role in the actual history of the Israelites since it too is not mentioned until six centuries after it supposedly occurred and had no apparent impact on the land of Egypt from whence half the nation's total population supposedly fled. So Moses must have either been a man who lived his life based on well-worn plots, plagiarizing popular stories of both kings and pagan gods with his very existence, and liberated maybe a dozen or so slaves... Or, the story just fits in with all the other stories, as stories based on older stories based on older stories based on older stories. So if there was a Moses, he wasn't the Moses of the Bible. And if there was a great exodus of Jews who were held captive in a foreign land to be used as slaves, it wasn't from Egypt. But that's a discussion for another episode. I want to thank you for listening to this episode of Dragons in Genesis. We will be back again in a few weeks to continue our examination of Moses and Exodus and even explore a few Moses stories that didn't make it into the final copies of the Bible. Until then, make sure you like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash dragons in Genesis. Be sure to subscribe and rate us on iTunes. And if you have any questions about this or any other episode or just about the Bible in general, just hop on Facebook and send us a personal message. I usually reply within a few hours. Thanks again for listening.